Well, good morning and welcome to River Church's online worship. Uh, it's a privilege uh, for me to be able to come into your home today and lead you. I'm Pastor Randy Caulfield. I lead River Church here in Brownsville and uh, we're going to meet here in just a few hours here in the worship space. But uh, for now, we're going to worship together online for those of you who aren't ready to to get out yet. Um, you're still staying at home and I, I understand that. I, I, I respect that and and I, I encourage that. And and so that's why we're doing, continue to do this online worship just for you. Um, now is a good time to, to go and uh, get your the items ready that you're going to need for our, our time of worship today. So you'll need uh, your Bible and something to write with, something to write on. Uh, you'll need your communion elements, so some bread and some juice. I will lead you in communion later on. Uh, now is a good time to fill up your coffee cup and uh, get rid of any distractions. If you have any questions about River Church, you can go to our website, riverchurchrgv.com, riverchurchrgv.com. All things River Church can be found there, including our, our gatherings, our online prayer gatherings and uh, community night gatherings. Uh, we'll have, those will be coming up again this week, and you can find that schedule. We have a virtual schedule online. Any other questions you might have about our church can be found there. All right, well, we're going to get started here in just a few minutes. Well, today is week five of our sermon series, Escaping the Lion's Den, a study of God's faithfulness in the book of Daniel. So it's week five. This is the final study uh, of this series, and I've enjoyed it. I hope you have as well. Uh, the context of our very own lives has been the fact that many of us are living in the lion's den of adversity right now. For you, the adversity it may be a relational difficulty. It may be a relationship that was recently severed. Perhaps it's financial troubles. Perhaps it's something at work or it's an emotional struggle. Perhaps it's an addiction that you're attempting to beat. Perhaps for you it's your health, some health difficulty. We live in through these periods of adversity and we ask questions like, where is God? Is, is God going through this with me? Is God faithful? Will he deliver me? From the lion's den of adversity and it's okay to admit that your own adversity right right now may not be that big of a deal to anyone else but it's a big deal to you and therefore it matters to god the context of the book of daniel of the backdrop is this it's 70 straight years of adversity for the nation of israel they're captives in a foreign land they've been hauled off as slaves uh, to Babylon, and then eventually the world power switches and it becomes Persia, but nonetheless they're still captives uh, away in this foreign land as slaves. Seventy straight years of adversity. The main character is Daniel. Uh, he wrote this book. He and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were 15-year-olds, uh, 15-year-old, uh, uh, the, the best and the brightest in, in their nation of Israel. They were, they were young lads. They were good-looking. They were smart. Uh, when they were hauled off as slaves, again, at the age of 15, they were immediately, uh, as slaves, taken into the king's court, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, because they were bright, because they were handsome, uh, because they had potential. Uh, and they were, they were taken into the court as slaves, but they were taken into the king's court to be groomed that they might one day be advisors to the king. And ultimately that, that does happen. And so we have this, this fellow Daniel, who is throughout the book of Daniel, he continues to, to, rise, to, 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 to be raised up by God as a, as a counselor to the king, as, as a prophet, as an interpreter of dreams. Uh, these are the main characters. And then we have these foreign kings, King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, last week, we looked at King Belshazzar, and, and this week we have a new king. Two kingdoms, three or four kings rise and fall as oppressors to the nation of Israel. But Daniel is there at every turn. God continues to esteem him. The theme in this book is God's sovereignty over human affairs. Meaning that God is powerful, he's in control, he's in rule and authority, uh, at every turn of events, he's sovereign over human, human affairs, over the election. God is sovereign over the election. He's, he's sovereign over COVID-19. 
and God is sovereign over the human affairs of your life, the, the adversity you're going through today. So this is week five, Daniel in the lion's den. We finally get to this story. It's kind of a, a, kind of a story book. Uh, you know, maybe you consider it a kid's story, and yet there's so much for all of us, all ages, to, to glean from the pages of Scripture, to learn from this passage. Let's jump right in. Again, uh, Daniel is on his third round of, of royalty, <clears throat> this third king, and yet he's still hanging in there. He's still an authority figure. He's still a counselor, an advisor to the king. Daniel 6, it says this, Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces. Darius is this new king. He's now the first Persian king. And he's, right before our eyes, he's creating a new government. He decides to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interest. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him, Daniel, over the entire empire. He's a foreigner, really a slave in some ways, a captive. And King Darius is going to make him um, ruler of the entire empire. Then the other administrators and the high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize, nothing to condemn. He was faithful, he was always responsible, completely trustworthy, so they concluded, aha, our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. Again, he's an Israelite. He worships a different God. He's a foreigner. What's going on here? Well, a new government is being formed right here before us in the pages of the Bible, the pages of history. You should know that Daniel is now 80 years old, and he's about to be thrown into a, a pit of lions. Even at, my, even at my age, it just hurts to be thrown around. Um, I've got young boys, teenage boys, young, and, and when I get thrown around, it hurts. Imagine 80 years of age, and he's about to get thrown into a pit. Here's the summary of the next few verses. The administrators, the, the, high, the high officers, they convinced the king... King Darius, to sign into law an order that for the next 30 days, anyone who prays uh, to anyone or any other God except King Darius would be thrown into a pit of hungry, ravenous lions. And the king, in his arrogance, um, because who doesn't want to be worshipped uh, King Darius, in his arrogance, he agrees to do so, to, to sign this law. Anybody worships anybody else, prays to anybody else for the next 30 days, you go into the pit. Uh, well, when he learns of the official's ill intent towards Daniel, who he really liked, oh, then the king was, was beside himself. What have I done, he says. He was immediately regretful of the decision that he'd made, but according to the, the rule of the kingdom of that day, the, the system that they were living under, uh, even King Darius could not retract his law once he had made it a law, uh, nor could he, he uh, stop the application of the law, the consequences. Um, so, so Daniel's religious convictions, uh, they had never been hidden. Uh, they had never uh, been done in secret, really. Everyone knew Daniel to be the same man, both privately and publicly. And I really believe that's why they esteemed him, because he was a man of integrity. Going on. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with the windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day just as he had always done. 
giving thanks to his God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and they found him praying and asking for God's help. So they went straight to the king and reminded him about his law. They're little snitches. So Daniel deliberately disobeyed civil authority, the, the law of the land of his day. Sometimes we as Christians, and it's not very often, but, but sometimes, and in the future, we as Christians will be called on to make difficult decisions, especially in the increasingly secular culture in which we live. Going on, then they told the king, that man Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, I've underlined that for emphasis, that man Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. Hearing this, the king was deeply troubled. And he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of this predicament. In the evening, the men went together to the king and they said, Your Majesty, you know that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. So at last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the, lion, into the den of lions. The king said to him, he said, Daniel, may your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. And then a summary of the next couple of verses um, Daniel, he's thrown into the pit, and the king that evening refused entertainment, he refused food, and instead he tossed and turned the night away, waiting for daybreak. Continuing our reading, very early in the morning, or very early the next morning, the king got up and, and hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel! Servant of the living God, was your God whom you serve so faithfully able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, long live the king. My God sent his angel to shut the lions mouths so that they would not hurt me. For I have been found innocent in his sight. And I have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed. And ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Not a scratch was found on him, for he, had, for he had trusted in his God. Then the king gave orders to arrest the men who had maliciously accused Daniel. He had them thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and their children. Then the lions leaped on them and tore them apart before they even hit the floor of the den. Last verse we'll read, 28. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. So a summary. An angel shuts the mouths of the lions for the evening and all is quiet in the pit. Now, there is good reason from the whole of Scripture, from the whole of the Bible, there, there is good reason to believe that this angel was actually Jesus Christ himself, the Lord himself, keeping Daniel company, keeping Daniel safe for the evening and shutting the mouths of the lions. And so as a result, we have Daniel's integrity being vindicated by the Lord. They knew him to be a man of integrity throughout the land and and the Lord vindicates that. Another result, the Lord's name and reputation increases in fame. Even King Darius praises the name of Daniel's God, Yahweh. And then we also have, as a result, Daniel being esteemed to new roles of leadership. If I can make some observations some big ideas here. Number one, you may always feel like an outsider in this world. Uh, for the believer, 
for, for, for those of us who, who say we're Christ followers, and not only do you say you're a Christ follower, but you, you live it out. You're a person of integrity. You pray privately. You live out your faith publicly. For, for, for the believer, we actually are outsiders in this world. Now, I want you to make friends, and I want you to engage culture, and I want you to be what the Bible says is salt and light, like seasoning in this world, so that, that Christ's essence and love is manifested throughout the world. I want you to be involved in, in, in secular world and school board meetings and softball practices, and booster clubs. But, but for the believer, we really are, in a sense, outsiders in this world. Now, think on this. Daniel is old. He's 80 years old now. He's not a 15-year-old now. Like when you're 15, you kind of kind of used to get knocked around and mistreated and disrespected. But, but he's now 80. And he's still identified as an outsider. Remember they, 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 the, the, uh, the other officials, they tell King, you know, that outsider, that slave, that captive, that Israelite. He never did fit in. As a man of 80 now, he still just doesn't belong. Jesus has told us repeatedly in the Gospels throughout Scripture, Jesus has told us repeatedly, you will have to give up some relationships in this world, some popularity in this world, some comfort, some safety, some security. If you're going to be my follower, it's not always going to be safe, Jesus says. It's not always going to be secure, Jesus says. And... It will all be worth it. Every penny of sacrifice you make, Jesus says, will be rewarded. The first observation here is that you may always feel like an outsider in this world. It kind of comes with being a Christ follower. Second observation from the story of Daniel is this. God rewards faithfulness. He always has. God has always rewarded faithfulness. Lamentations 3 says that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It's new every morning. The Lord's faithful in rewarding your faithfulness. And if you quit too soon, if you give up too soon, you'll not see the Lord show up. The Lord rewards finishing well. Slow and faithful walk in the same direction. That is the life of the Christian. The slow and steady walk toward Jesus. That's the life of a Christian. And the Lord rewards faithfulness. You show me a person who quit who quit on the Lord because he says, ah, God did not honor, he did, he did not honor his promises to me, and so I'm quitting on the Lord. You, you show me a person who quit on the Lord, and I'll show you a person who quit too soon. Faithful and true, steady as she goes, the Lord rewards faithfulness. Galatians 6 says this, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. What's, what's Paul saying in Galatians 6? There? He's saying, I know you're tired, but don't grow weary. Now, I know, you're, I know you may be tired of doing good, but don't quit. For, for, for in due season, at just the right time, you will be rewarded if you don't give up. Hang in there. Observations from Daniel's life. The first was you may always feel like an outsider in this world. Number two, God rewards your faithfulness. And number three, Jesus shows up in my mess, in your mess. In the mess of life, Jesus shows up. He did this for Daniel's three friends 
several weeks ago, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were being persecuted for their faith. They were, uh, they were thrown into the fiery furnace, like a really hot pizza oven. And, and, and Jesus showed up. There was a fourth character in that fire. It was Jesus himself. And in today's story, Jesus shows up in the uh, lion's den with Daniel. And he'll show up in the, in the middle of your mess, in the middle of your tragedy as well. Some of you know that. You've experienced that. Some of you are younger in your faith. And, and I, I promise you, in the mess, in the fray, in the tragedy of your life, Jesus will show up. The Lord is fighting for you. The Lord was fighting for these four young men, and then Daniel's now an old man, and he's fighting for you. At this very moment, Jesus is fighting for you. He's keeping you in your faith. We'll talk more about that. He is keeping you. You're not keeping yourself. Jesus is keeping you. The greatest fear in life, or the greatest fears in life, come not, come not from what we can see, but most often from what we can't see. I know that's true of me. My, my greatest fear in life, it's not a physical lion in front of me, but it's a mythical lion who wants to destroy wants to destroy me in my dreams. This mythical lion wants to destroy me in my fears, destroy me in my worry, destroy me in my anxiety. Um, the greatest fear is, is the, the next unpredictable disaster. It's not a physical lion. It's a mythical. It's a mental, emotional, spiritual battle. That's where our greatest Fears lie. The Israelites as a nation, historically, they, had, they were a people who traveled. Even when they had their own land, they would regularly travel up to Jerusalem, to the temple for worship. They were on foot. They had to cover a lot of rocky terrain. There were bandits. There were wild animals. There was danger at every turn. And they would sing songs like Psalm 121. I lift my eyes up to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. They would cry out time and time again. I'm in danger. I'm, I'm stuck in a pit. There's, there's, there is, uh, there is danger right around the corner. Where do I look for my help? I look to the hills. I, I look to my Lord. In the small, tiny little book in the New Testament, Jude, in verse, in verse 24, it says this. Now to him, that's God, to him who is able to keep you, there's that same word again, to keep you from stumbling and, and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Scripture teaches us that, that Jesus is keeping you. He's able to keep you from stumbling. He's able to keep you from falling. He's able to keep you blameless. Jesus had kept Daniel. First in his faithful act of praying, when it, it, it would have been much easier to just give up praying for 30 days. Jesus was able to keep him right in the middle of that fearful time Daniel goes right back to what he'd always, he'd always known to be true. I'm going to go and I'm going to fall on my knees before my Lord and I'm going to pray in this difficult time. And Jesus was able to keep him then and therefore Daniel knew that Jesus would also keep him 
in the lion's den. Jesus promises, he says this in John 16, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. Jesus is keeping you. He's keeping you. You say, Pastor Randy, what is Jesus keeping me from? Well, several things. The Lord Jesus, according to Scripture, is keeping you from evil. As it said, he keeps you from stumbling, that he might present you to God, holy and blameless, faithful and true. It's not you keeping yourself from evil. You might think that you're obedient, you're particularly uh, faithful on your own, you're, you're all that, you're a really loyal dude, and well, maybe, but according to Scripture, you're not keeping yourself from evil. You're not causing yourself to stumble. Jesus is keeping you. He's keeping you from evil. He's keeping your life. In other words, your very existence the fact that you take another breath, that, that you're able to wake up in the morning after a good night's sleep, he's, he's keeping you in your life. He is keeping your soul. Matthew 10, Jesus tells us, don't fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. And what he's saying is, I hold your very soul. Your spiritual essence, he is keeping that. He is also keeping for you an inheritance. An inheritance. First Peter chapter 1 says that Jesus is keeping for you an inheritance that is imperishable. In other words, it doesn't rot, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't grow old and stink and break down. He's keeping for you an inheritance. Who doesn't want an inheritance? We all kind of dream that maybe one day, we don't want Aunt Molly to die, but maybe one day Aunt Molly, if she dies, she'll leave us an inheritance. And, and the scripture tells us that Jesus is keeping for you an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, unfading. It's kept for you in heaven, by God's power, it's being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. It's 1 Peter 1, 4. Jesus is keeping for you an inheritance. So he's keeping all sorts of things. He's keeping, he's keeping uh, you from evil. He's keeping your life. The fact that you take another breath, you say, praise Jesus, I, I'm still alive. He is keeping your soul he is keeping for you an inheritance. There's a fourth observation. And that is this. A Christian ethic, a teaching, is that the Lord will prevail. Now, a Christian ethic, that means a Christian teaching. When I say a Christian ethic, I mean, it's, it's a statement. We would say, if I'm going to be a Christ follower, I'm compelled to believe this. I don't have to be a Christ follower, but if I'm a Christ follower, this is something I'm compelled to believe. This is a truth, a central teaching. And, and, and number four, a Christian ethic is the Lord will prevail. Despite appearances to the contrary, God is in control. D despite what your life might look like at this very moment in time, know this, dear son, daughter of the living God, the Lord will prevail. That is what Daniel would want us to know in writing these five stories for us. The Lord will prevail. The, the Lord will win the day. All of my fears, all of my anxious moments are are, are bound up by the lie that what if the Lord doesn't prevail? What if, what if things crash down upon me and nothing ultimately goes well? A central teaching of the Bible, the Lord will prevail. He will win the day. 
God's justice, his, his rightness, his, 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 his obligation to always do what's right, to always ultimately bring about justice. God's justice will one day rule all of existence. We call it the new heaven and the new earth. But not only is it something that's going to happen one day, he is working that out in our lives this very moment. You'll be rewarded if you don't faint, if you don't quit. COVID-19 has led some people to to stray, to, to fall away from the Lord. But not you. I commend you. I say, hang in there. Don't quit. Just a little longer. When the nation of Israel felt like quitting, they had this song. They would sing it to one another. They'd sing it to this, themselves, and it says this. The Lord bless you and keep you. Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Isn't that what we really want? Isn't that what you're really looking for today? How does this apply to my life? Like, what must I do if this is true? What, what, what's my response? Well, my response is something like this. Maybe you can resonate with these words. I will hold fast. In these dark days, I will remain faithful. I will trust in the Lord with confidence. Confidence that Jesus is keeping me. He is sustaining me. He is actually doing the holding. And in Jesus, he is actually doing the, the remaining faithful that I am attempting. It's actually Jesus keeping me in my faithfulness. And, and it is actually Jesus who is, who is doing the building of my confidence. Because I'm not a very confident person on my own. But, but Jesus, he is keeping me in my confidence. One last thing that he is doing that we haven't even talked about, and that is he is praying for me. He is praying for you. At this very moment, Jesus is praying over your life. He is praying over you in your sleeping. Jesus himself, he is praying over you in your waking. That is the eternal ministry of Jesus Christ. He is, inter he is, he is praying prayers, interceding for you. He is He is. Um, advocating on your behalf. That means he's, he's in your corner. He's fighting for you. He is praying to God the Father for you. He is keeping you, holding you fast. There are a number of passages in the New Testament that say that. I'll give them to you, and you can read them later. Hebrews 7.25, Romans 9.34. And then the last passage that I want to, to read and may it wash over you today like, like medicine, like, like a warm blanket, like a cure. First John chapter 2, it says this. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but... If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Jesus is in heaven right now advocating on your behalf. He's, he's, he's praying over you, praying for you. Rest in that, my friend. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered around the table with his disciples and he was, he was so concerned about their safe keeping as he is about yours. 
He wanted to make sure that they and all of us for the rest of history would be kept safe physically and spiritually, relationally. And, and so that night he spoke deep words of comfort. He, he held up the bread and he held up the cup on that night and he said to his disciples and he says to us today, from now on when you do this, do this remembering me. Jesus held up the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks and he and his disciples ate of the bread and he said, this is my body broken for the forgiveness of your sins. From now on when you do this, do this remembering me. And then he held up the cup. He blessed it, he gave thanks. He drank from it, his disciples drank from it and he said, from now on when you do this, remember that this is my, this represents my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Jesus compels us from now on when you do this, when you eat this bread, drink from this cup, remember me. Remember my work on the cross. Remember that I finished what I started. Remember that all, remember all of the, the promises are now made good for you because of Jesus' work on the cross. So Jesus, we celebrate you. We, we, don't, we don't mourn, we celebrate. For you were no victim, you were a conqueror. You conquer, conquered sin and death and hell and the grave and, and now you rule and reign on high where you are interceding praying for us at every moment so we celebrate you i invite you now right there in the privacy of your of your own home to to break the bread and drink from the cup and by yourself or with your family members with your friends celebrate the goodness of Jesus. Okay, well, that's a wrap. Uh, that's it for, the, for today. I, I hope you will go away from uh, our worship time together, just being encouraged by the fact that, that the Lord is keeping you. He is keeping you. He is, he is fighting for you. He is working on your behalf. He is praying for you. Be encouraged, my friend. If you have any questions about that, maybe, maybe there's something that just stirred in your soul and you, you'd like to, to dialogue with me or one of the other pastors a little bit more about that. You can reach out to me or any of the elders. Uh, you, can, you can send me an email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com, randy at riverchurchrgv.com. Just, just reach out and I'd love to, to respond. Maybe you're new to town and new to River Church. Maybe you don't have any connection with any church and you would like to learn how you might get uh, connected or more deeply connected here at River Church. Shoot me an email and, and, I'll, and I'll let you know how. If we as elders can serve you in any way, uh, we would love to do that. Just, just let me know of your need by sending me an email. Um, again, if you want to know what's going on this week, go to our website uh, and uh, check out our virtual calendar. Uh, now is a good time for you to go online and, and give. Uh, all of the good work that we do here at River Church is based on your good gifts, your generosity. And many of you do. You give faithfully, you give sacrificially, you give in, you give in extravagant ways. And I trust that the Lord is continuing to bless you in that. Um, so you can go to the website and you can give. Um, it's uh, online. It's safe and easy and intuitive and kind of fun. Many of you in this age of COVID have, have now been giving in that way. And I encourage you to do that right now. So we might continue this, this ministry of the church. Well, that's it. I want you to know I'm praying for you. I want you to know I'm rooting for you. And I love you guys. Enjoy the rest of your day.